everybody. Hi. <laughs> My name is Carlin Stewart. I'm the site manager here at Los Osos Historic Site. And today we bring you the second episode of Mesa Talks, our partnership with Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project and Los Osos Historic Site. Um, so today our speaker is our very own Rebecca Ward. She is the ranger here at Los Osos Historic Site and she will be presenting on I will be talking about the Lucero family, the name itself, and how it came to be in northern New Mexico. Awesome! Um, so just a couple announcements uh, for Los Luceros is we have our um, Dawn Till Dusk Day, which is June 5th, and it is also our New Mexico Outdoor Pass program, which the uh, theme is mammals. So come learn all about mammals of northern New Mexico. Um, other than that, enjoy the presentation. Okay, so I will dive right into it. As I said, uh, my topic is the Lucero family. Not only the family itself though, but the name. Uh, I have worked at Los Luceros Historic Site for a little over two years now, and I am the interpretive ranger here at Los Luceros. So I give tours, and my job is really to uh, connect this site to people in the modern day. So I don't interpret a language uh, from one language into another. I interpret the site's history and culture, the thousands of years of it, into something that people can connect to and learn about. Uh, and so I'll just ask Carly, could you get the lights real quick? Thank you. Okay, uh, so let's, this is our table of contents. For this, I have four sections that we're going to go over. I will talk specifically about the history of the name. I know not everybody is super excited about etymology or the study of where words come from, but I love it and I'm going to dive into that because that is one of the questions I get the most at Los Lucetos, is what does Lucetto mean? Uh, then I will talk about the Lucetto family in the New World. Then I'll focus more specifically on the Lucetto family in New Mexico. And then we'll talk about anglicized additions that have been made to the name. So I do have a quote. Uh, I thought it would be fun to start out with one. I could not actually find a quote by a prominent Lucero family member that was connected to this site. Uh, I tried to find one by Pedro Lucero de Godoy, and all I could find were quotes about how much he loved the Spanish crown. <laughs> so I went with, it is not a country of light on things, it is a country of things in light by George O'Keefe. And that quote really lends itself to the meaning of Lucero. Uh, and Lucero means the morning star. It's all about light. Uh, coming from the Spanish prefix luz, which means light, the word Lucero directly translates into the morning star or the evening star. And uh, it also has to do with horses, though. Uh, the star on a horse's nose or the blaze down their nose is also called a loose saddle, and it's, so it's got a strong connotation to horses. Um, but this specific case, we're pretty sure that Los Los Settles means the morning star. So is it a star or is it a planet, though? Uh, and Venus is connected to the Los Settles. The morning star is actually the planet Venus. Um, Venus is the second planet from the sun and is visible to Earth for a good portion of the year. Um, usually sighted near the horizon, it can be seen even in the morning and evening light, giving it the nickname the morning or evening star. Uh, as a name, you may also notice that Lucero shares the root Latin Luke with the angel Lucifer. And so this is not like the connotation or connection to the devil at, at all or anything, but it is a sign of how important the word Lucetta was. It's connected to not only heavenly bodies that are seen by people all throughout the world pretty much all year, but it's also connected to Catholic uh, mythology and Catholic uh, mythos and everything. So it's, it's a very intrinsic part of Spanish, you know, culture at the time. And so having this, this name, Lucero, being connected to heavenly bodies in Catholicism shows how important the word and the name was. And you can see why a family would want to connect themselves to this word. Um, this is just an example of how Venus looks in the sky. It looks exactly like a star. So you can see a tiny little Venus over here and then a crescent moon. Um, usually it's more near the horizon. And 
in a lot of pictures, you can actually just see Venus just floating right above the horizon. Uh, but Venus in particular was used by cultures all over the world to decide when plant rotation should happen, especially in countries or civilizations that were near the equator that didn't have noticeable seasons necessarily. And um, so it just it's a very intrinsic part of a lot of people's cultures. And it's one of the heavenly bodies that we see pretty much constantly and pretty consistently. It moves in the sky at a consistent rate every single year. And the Lucero family in Spain was specifically recognized, um, or recorded rather, in 1129 in Aragon, Spain. And this is the first instance we see of the name being recorded, but that definitely doesn't mean that Lucero wasn't around before then. Um, it uh, was uh, probably recorded way before then and used as a family name, but we may not have the documents. We do know that the name itself is about a thousand years old. Uh, and in the 1500s in Mexico is when it finally pops up. Uh, and that is when the first family with a name Lucero in it moved to Spain in the late 1500s-ish. Uh, and then finally in the 1700s New Mexico, you really see the name established very strongly, but the 1600s are when uh, the family really became prominent in New Mexico. So we'll talk about the Lucero's more depthly of the New World. Uh, the Lucero de Godoy family settled in Mexico originally, and the name first comes together in uh, the between the marriage of Juan Lucero de Godoy and Inez Lucero Gonzalez. And they had eight children together. Their first couple of children were born in Oaxaca, Mexico, but after they were married, they moved to Mexico City, where their third child, Pedro Lucero de Godoy, was born. And what I thought was really interesting was that most of the children in the Lopez de Godoy family took the name Lopez or Lopez de Godoy. For some reason, Pedro was the only child out of the eight who took one of his mother's names uh, of Lucero and combined it with his father. So without Inés Lucero Gonzalez and this marriage that they had, uh, Pedro Lucero de Godoy would never have moved to New Mexico, and Los Luceros would not be named what it is. So our name actually comes from a prominent woman in Mexico, which I thought was a really cool um, addition to this. I always thought it was going to be Lucero de Godoy was just always the name, but it was a, a Lucero Gonzalez. Um, and one of Pedro's younger brothers, his name was Diego, and he went by the name Lopez de Godoy, and he moved to New Mexico as well with his brother. So the Lopez and Lucero families are actually very closely connected. Uh, so this is the basic family tree for Pedro Lucero de Godoy. And we're going to be focusing on him because he's the direct ancestor of the man who gave Los Luceros his name in the 1800s. So Pedro Lucero de Godoy was born in Mexico City in 1599. When he was about 16 or 17 years old, he decided to become a guardsman for the Camino Real. So he would protect shipments of goods that would come north from Mexico City to Santa Fe or the Santa Fe area, because that was before Santa Fe was officially founded. And Pedro Lucero de Godoy, in making that decision, was actually cementing himself as one of the men who established Santa Fe. And uh, Lucero de Godoy is one of the 16 founding families of Santa Fe. So he was there, he had settled there in about 1617, 1618, and married his first wife, Maria Petronalia Zamora, um, and she actually has a really interesting anecdote that was recorded that she remembers marrying Pedro Lucero de Godoy when she was 11 years old. But you may notice that she was born in 1598 and he was born in 1599, and if he didn't come up the Camino Real until he was 16 years old, that is definitely a discrepancy in her memory. And it could just be that she didn't really record her years the same way, or um, there could be a, a lot of 
instances on why that happened, but we do know they were not married when they were 11 years old. Um, they were married when they were either 17 or 18 years old in um, the land that they had been given outside of what would become the city of Santa Fe. And they had two children together. Sorry that that's cut off on the side. I'm not sure why. It looks fine on my presentation, but that's Juan Lucero de Godoy uh, and then Catalina Lucero de Godoy were their two children. And Maria Petronalia de Mora was a Castiza woman, which means that her mother was Mestiza and her father was a Spaniard. Um, and so she was part native. And she had been born in Mexico City, but had moved to Mexico as a small child. And her familiarity with the territory is most likely why Pedro Lucero de Godoy married her. Um, she was also connected to a pretty prominent family, and she was the youngest daughter of one of the more politically prominent men who moved to the Santa Fe area. Then after she passed away in 1647, Pedro Lucero de Godoy pretty much immediately married Francesca Gomez Robledo. And she, you may notice, is nearly 30 years his junior. <laughs> uh, and so I'm sure that was pretty typical of the time. Um, but they together had at least three children. But this is not matching up with what I've seen in census records and what I've seen recorded about the time. I mean, they didn't really have what we would call a census, but when Pedro Lucero de Godoy was made the Lieutenant Governor of the New Mexico Territory in 1663, it was said that he had five daughters of marriageable, marriageable age living at home with him at the time. And Catalina had already been married and had a son when he uh, was made the Lieutenant Governor. She'd been married for quite a while. And so Inez and Maria Ana were definitely not his only daughters that were living at home. He probably had at least two other, if not three other daughters that we just don't have any really formal record of. And that seems to be a theme that I can see a lot through going through genealogical uh, records that date back this far, uh, especially with women who are married. Uh, we just don't see a lot of like connection to them. It's, you know, they're all, their importance is related to the importance of their husband. And so it could just be that Inez and Maya Ana and Catalina married, made like more politically significant marriages that were recorded and it mattered who their fathers were. Um, and for his other three daughters, we just may not know, but we also have a missing son. So there was a Pedro Jr. that Juan talks about in some of his letters, but that is not in any record that I've seen officially on who Pedro Lucero de Godoy's children were. So he had at least two sons and three daughters, but he could have had as many as nine children. Um, so who was Pedro Lucero de Godoy? I mentioned that he was the Lieutenant Governor of the New Mexican Territory, um, but he was also had, sorry, he also had a number of accomplishments added to that roster well before he became Lieutenant Governor of the Territory. Um, he was also the Maestro de Campo, which is essentially the Chief of Staff for the Territorial Governor. And he had been Maestro de Campo for quite a while. Uh, he made a lot of decisions and it was also connected to his status as the syndic of the Franciscans. And essentially, a syndic is someone who is given power in the organization who is not technically a part of the power structure. So while Lucero, uh, the Lucero de Godoy family was a proponent of the Franciscans, supported them financially, and with uh, political maneuvering, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a friar. He wasn't, you know, a, a monk or anything of that nature. He was just a man who was dedicated to the Franciscans and that sect of the Catholic Church. Uh, and so he helped the church make uh, secular governance decisions within their within their power structure, essentially. And being the maestro de campo and the syndic of the Franciscans really lent themselves to one another. Uh, and even when he became the lieutenant governor, because the lieutenant governor was in charge of decisions on who went to jail and when he came out of jail, he had a lot of a lot of power in that regard. And uh, especially when he was dealing with you know being 
in charge of essentially imprisoning people for converting or not, uh, specifically with Native American people in mind. Uh, he definitely jailed a lot of Native American people and was not necessarily, he, he was definitely, and I mentioned this earlier, he was 100% for whatever the Spanish crown wanted. He was not a revolutionary, he was definitely right in line with exactly what the Spanish crown wanted, which probably helped him become the lieutenant governor of the territory. But I don't have a specific death date for Pedro. Uh, I do know that he died before the Pueblo Revolt, and it was described as him dying well before the Pueblo Revolt. But I don't know what context well before means. Was it a few months before the Pueblo Revolt? Was it a couple years before? Uh, I, I think it was probably the same year as the Pueblo Revolt, just probably January or February of that year, but I don't have anything that confirms that. Um, his wife, though, his second wife, Francesca, she did die during the Pueblo Revolt from everything that I've seen. Uh, she was recorded on the list of names of people who most likely perished on August 10th in 1680. And uh, as a resident of Santa Fe, that is definitely a possibility for her. As far as I can tell, all of his children, though, made it out of this, the territory of New Mexico alive. Um, so now we will get specific into the land right here in northern New Mexico and how the Lucero family ended up here at Los Luceros. So before we jump into that though, I'd like to just point out the coat of arms. So the Lucero coat of arms is the same coincidentally as the Lucero de Godoy coat of arms, but the Godoy coat of arms is very different. You may have noticed a couple slides ago. But uh, the Lucero coat of arms is purple and white and it has two lines facing one another on a field of white. Then it always has a helm on top, and I have seen five feathers in addition to this three. And so it just, it just depends. I think it's artistic differences and probably years, but it always has the voluminous ribbons, the feathers, and the lines in the center. Uh, so the Lucero families. Uh, Lucero was a name that was carried on by Pedro's either two or three sons. And by the 1880s, there were more than 2,000 families living in New Mexico with the last name Lucero. And this includes Julian Lucero and his descendants. And uh, so we're going to cover a pretty significant chunk of time. Um, to my knowledge, there were no Lucero family members living on the Martín Sedano land grant before 1757. As a significant land grant of over 51,000 acres, I'm sure that the Martin Zarano family and the Lusa family had political dealings both here and in the capital. Uh, I believe that Juan Lusa de Godoy had been made, um, not the alcalde of the Española area, but he had had a bunch of political influence as well, and that was passed on to his children. Um, Santiago Lucero de Godoy uh, was the great grandson of Pedro Lucero de Godoy through Juan, and he married onto the property in 1757. And uh, just as a fun fact, when I was searching about Santiago and Barba Badia, um, they were actually married in the San Francisco de Assisi Church in Santa Fe. And I don't know if that was like a really big deal at the time, but most marriages, death certificates, and birth certificates or records that I've seen from that time period uh, usually identify San Juan, New Mexico, uh, the Pueblo, or Rio Riva County as the places that people were married or born. So I don't know if it's because he was a Lucero de Godoy and had originally lived in Santa Fe that they got married at the San Francisco de SCC Church, but that is where they were married. And um, Barbara Padilla was the granddaughter of son um, of Sebastian Martin Zarano, the man who claimed the original land grant. And because of that, Barbara Padilla was actually the person who was set to inherit pretty much everything here. And that happens a lot as things move through female lines, and that's why the name always changes. But because she got married, or maybe rather she had to get married, Santiago Lucero became the man with the power of attorney essentially here. He was the man who made all the decisions. Um, he inherited all of the land, the main house. Um, he was the one who made decisions about what happened because he married Barbara Padilla. 
and they had a few children here. They lived in the main house. And most importantly, though, Santiago Lucero de Godoy, when he was married, um, his nephew Julian, who was 10 years old when he got married, uh, frequently visited Los Luceros. And that is where Julian Lucero fell in love with his property. And he decided um, as a child that he wanted to own this area. And he would. So we are going to look really quick at this map from the 1800s. And I know you can't really see it, and it's very, very small, and I have to zoom in very big. But this circle here, that says Luceros. And so this is a map of the territories of New Mexico and Utah. So this was a map that was created in the 1800s. Uh, by an American. And Los Luceros was important enough to garner attention right there. And so it's in between, this says the San Juan Pueblo, and then right above it is Embudo, and Los Luceros is right where it should be. So we know that's us. We've been on maps uh, since well before the, we were a state well before we were marked, um, you know, as anything that the United States was looking at. Um, and I just, we, this is a map we have in the visitor center. So if you want to look at it up close, it's, it's in one of the cases next to the front desk. But, uh, Julian Lucero was a very politically motivated and wealthy man. He was a Lucero de Godoy. Uh, he was originally from Santa Fe. And like I said, he had visited the property many times as a child, visiting his uncle and his aunt-in-law. And he, like I said, decided that he wanted Los Luceros to be his home. So he pursued all of the other Lucero descendants, as well as the Martin Serrano descendants. And he put together a lot of the original land print again. It had been broken up partially. And I do not know really how big the, the property was when Julian Lucero uh, put it together, but it was thousands of acres again. Um, and he, you know, used it as a typical ranch in northern New Mexico. They ranch cattle and sheep. Uh, he planted onions, chili, and garlic. Uh, they were, I'm sure they grew corn, beans, and squash as well, like marmol. And Julian Luzero really cemented Los Luceros as this place that was going to become very important. And in fact, he was so popular and he was so politically motivated that he actually got the name of this place changed from, at the time it was called La Plaza de los Angeles, and before that it had been called La Soledad. And he had become so important that people changed the name of this area to La Plaza de los Luceros, and specifically connected to Julian Lucero. He was the judge of Rio Riva County. Then Rio Riva County was one of the seven original counties of New Mexico. And that was when Rio Riva, as you may have noticed on the other map, pretty much stretched from the edge of California to the edge of the United States almost. And he was incredibly important. He cemented Los Luceros as the seat of Rio Riva County. And he also did a lot of things to the house. Uh, he added the second story, we're pretty sure, and he remodeled in a Greek revival style, which at the time I'm sure had a lot of uh, political motivations behind it, a lot of like, look at how wealthy and prosperous we are, we're doing really well, I have this style from the East Coast in America on my house in New Mexico. And so that's where you see all these weird quote unquote Grecian columns, um, and then the balcony on the second floor are all indicative of that style in the mid-1800s. And he presided over court cases in this house as well. So having a pretty recognizable house, a very new fancy house, I'm sure helped uh, sink the importance of the fact that you were holding trials here uh, into people who were, who were on trial. <laughs> and uh, yes, the Alma Sen was used as a, a jail, the storehouse next to the Hacienda. Uh, but as far as I can tell, it only happened once, maybe twice. And um, it, Julian Lucero is the one who made those decisions, whether to jail people or not. But Rio Riva County was very much, um, we didn't have a sheriff, we didn't have police officers. We didn't have, um, you know, this was literally all the governance of the whole county happened in this house. <laughs> that, that was it. Um, and uh, he also planted the most expansive apple orchard that was here. 
and uh, that was a 4,000 tree orchard that expanded from the back of the hacienda to where the highway to Taos was. And so that's the row that's right in front of the site. It was uh, more than 4,000 trees, and there is one still alive, and it is in the, the sheep paddock behind the hacienda. So if you want to see it, you can. Um, it's not a dwarf apple tree like the apple trees we have now, so it's a pretty tall tree, and the apples it produces now are very, very tiny. <laughs> I think that tree is coming to the end of its life. But you know, it's a good 150 years old, so it gave a, a good shot. Um, but so, uh, who inherited the Los Settles property when he died? Uh, and that is a very interesting answer. Uh, Elias Clark is a man from Missouri who was Irish uh, by ancestry and American by culture, I guess. And he came out to Los Settles on a trading mission and he ended up here, I am not sure how. But Julian Luceto just happened to have a daughter who was 26 years old and in need of a husband. And Elias Clark wanted to marry her. And they did. They got married in um, 1850. And uh, Elias Clark was in his 40s and she was in her 20s. Uh, so pretty typical of the time. But they only had one child together. And this is Maria Martha Luceto. Uh, the woman who married Eliza Clark, and that is their daughter, Eliza Clark. And um, there, she also had a daughter named Louisa, and that's her. And I confuse Elias, Eliza, and Louisa like there's no tomorrow. So if I slip up, I'm sorry. Uh, their names are just really similar, and Eliza married Louise. And so it's just, it's, it gets a little twisty in there. Um, but Julian Luceto's youngest child was Maria Martha. And he had her when she was, he was 59 years old and his wife was in her 40s. And um, so he was very old when she finally got married. He, he was in his 80s. And he died three years after they got married. And he deeded the land, the house, and his political power to Elias Clark, pretty much. And I don't have pictures of Elias Clark, I don't know too much about him because only nine years after he got to New Mexico, he died of tuberculosis, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it was called a lung complaint at the time, which is most likely tuberculosis. He could have had some other, you know, he could have gotten the flu and died. It was really, really bad. Um, but he, I'm pretty sure, had tuberculosis. It, it seemed like, you know, on certificates that it was pretty, pretty tuberculosis y. Um, and this left. Uh, this left Maria Martha alone as a woman in the mid-1800s with a girl child. And Maria Martha had to do whatever she could, pretty much, to secure her place here. She had a lot of brothers, she had a lot of nephews, she had a lot of cousins, all with the Lucero name, who could have taken this property from her, and that would have been completely legal in Spanish colonial times, uh, because they had more, in the eyes of the law, they had more of a uh, right to be here than she did as a woman with a girl child. And so because of this, we have the Ortiz and the Lucero family really coming together. Um, uh, this happened in 1865 when Luis Maria Ortiz married Maria Eliza Clark. She was 13 years old and he was 18 years old. The Ortizes were an incredibly significant family in this area as well. Uh, they were a farming family just like the Lucero family was. And I do know that, I don't know, this is like a pretty good theory on my heart, I think in a way, that uh, this was a political marriage and uh, Eliza and Luis didn't have their first child until Eliza was well into her 20s. So I'm pretty sure that Luis, as a not firstborn son of a farming family, was probably looking for an opportunity to marry into attractive land. And it were, turned out working out perfectly that he married a woman that he then fell in love with pretty well, as far as I can tell. Um, this is the couple who are buried in the chapel here at Los Luceros to this day. Um, and they had five children together in this house. 
and Louise and Eliza were the last Hispanic couple to own the house and the property here. So really, uh, she's the last, pretty much Lucetto, the last direct Lucetto descendant to own this property and to farm it and work here. And um, we uh, see that um, Luis and Eliza made a lot of decisions and Luis used the momentum from the Lucero name to make Los Luceros one of the most important and uh, politically significant farms in northern New Mexico. Uh, we're pretty sure that he continued, well, we do know that he continued on orchard. He planted a grape vineyard here and produced tens of thousands of gallons of wine every year. Uh, he was politically significant enough and had a large enough farm that he would actually send agricultural reports to the United States government in the late 1800s. And uh, Luis Ortiz is the man who sold this house and the six acres of it to Mary Cabot Will right in 1923. So as far as we can tell, uh, Luis's children were not interested in owning this farm. Uh, his four daughters had all moved to Santa Fe and his son, Haspar, had actually moved to California with his wife, Ruby, where they had like eight children. And that's pretty much uh, the Ortizes. And uh, they were, their, their name is on a lot of documents and I really love that they kept the name Lucetos on here. Um, and they didn't try to change it or anything. Uh, but the last Lucero family to live here at Los Luceros were Abel and Ursula Lucero. And this is them uh, on their wedding day, I believe, was the caption. Uh, it's one of those, and the picture previously in this one are one of those, um, you know, pictures that they would take and then someone would paint over it in the 1800s, a really popular to do, and that's why they look kind of like that. Um, but Abel purchased what was described at the time as a small tract of land, and I don't know how much that is, but it was a few acres of lease, um, from his parents in the late 1890s. And by the early 1900s, he had built what we call the Victorian Cottage. And the Victorian Cottage is stop number three on the self-guided tour if you're ever here. And uh, it's a small six-room family home that uh, housed his wife and all eight of their children. And uh, all their children slept in the attic, which is, I you get them out from their foot, they're upstairs. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they would be the last Lucero family to live here at what we call Los Luceros, as far as I know. I'm sure there are family members who still have the Lucero name that own a tract of land within the original, like, chunk of lands that Julian Lucero owned. But uh, the, this couple was the last that was right here on our property. And um, uh, they would be the last people here uh, in about the early 1930s. And they weathered the stock market crash pretty well. But the thing that got them was a flood that killed most of their sheep stock in the early 1930s. So they were a sheep herding family. They were also a family of carpenters. And a really terribly timed flood happened and killed like 99% of their sheep stock. And in basically the blink of an eye, over the course of one day, they went from being a pretty well set family to owing money to the bank, pretty much. They knew they were not going to be able to pay their dues um, because they had taken out a loan to pay Abel's parents for the land that they were on. And uh, the bank foreclosed on their house. And uh, there's still some bad blood a little bit between the Lucetto family and their, their feelings on Mary Cat Wheelwright because she owned the big house at the time. And she was looking to purchase more property uh, around Los Luceros. And because of that, I don't know if she knowingly took advantage of the fact that they were being foreclosed upon, but she let the bank foreclose on them, immediately bought their property, and then evicted the family from their home. After she evicted them, she then rented the house to the Montoya family. And so that created a lot of bad blood between the Luceros and Mary Cavill Wright. And so we do, I even still have blue settle family members who are, like whose grandparents or parents have been born in the Victorian cottage come here and 
you know, ask about Mary Kevin Will, right? <laughs> and what she did and why they think she did it and how, you know, their grandmother would still like shake her fist at Mary Kevin Will, right? You know, it's this, um, it seemed that she, she wasn't making a decision that really helped their family when she could have. And, um, oh, Mary Cavalry was such a wealthy woman that she may have had a team of lawyers who was, like, taking care of things, um, and then and they decided to overlook them. Um, but the Lucetto family uh, left the property in the early 1930s, and like I said, we still have visitors, but after that, uh, pretty much the whole property was only owned by people who had never, like, weren't from New Mexico. Um, and, and that is an interesting, like, series of time. Between 1958 and 2000, it, it was a really odd time. A lot of weird things were added here or taken out. <laughs> but so how did the Lucero name become Lucero's? Um, and what is with that S? So, According to correct Spanish grammar, an S should never have been added to the end of the name Lucero. Um, so you don't pluralize a family like that. You would say um, La Familia Lucero or Familia Lucero. It's the Lucero family. Um, and you don't just add an S on the end. Um, that is, you know, it's an interesting affectation, although that's not necessarily anything new. Uh, the name here, originally during the Martin Sedano era was an incredibly long name that was shortened to La Soledad. And pretty much, I cannot remember it in Spanish, but in English, it was the northern outpost of the upper territory of New Spain um, dedicated to Our Lady of Solitude is essentially what it translated into. And instead of calling it all of that, the locals would call it La Soledad, and that was something that caught on so much that it was put in official documents that were sent to the Spanish crown in Mexico City and in back to Spain. And so we see, you know, La Plaza de Los Lucero would probably have just been Los Lucero. But when the Americans come in is when we see the S being added. And it's probably just, you know, an accidental misunderstanding of like someone was like oh well you know if it's pluralized everything should be plural and so they're using incor incorrect spanish grammar rules on the wrong part of of a you know a capitalized word uh, so it's a great example of spanglish which is really interesting it's you know it's said a little thing it's just an s but um when los Losados was made a state historic site in 2019 there was actually some discussion on whether we should drop the S off of the name or not. Should we keep it Los Lucetos or should we go back to correct Spanish grammar? Should we, should we throw back all the way to Julian Lucero's time and call this Los Lucero or La Plaza de Los Lucero again? And we decided, well, I'm not we, I was not part of the decision, but like the royal we, like the, the state, decided that we should keep it favoring consistency over grammatical accuracy. So that S has been on there since the 1850s, since 1847, you know, ish, when, or is it 1848? Um, when we became a US territory, and when General Kearney came in here, because this could have been as far back as Julian Lucero's first interactions with the US, were him letting the, U.S. government and the U.S. military used the field of Los Lucetos to sleep here on their way to quell the Taos Rebellion. And the S could have been added as far back as then. It could have been a misunderstanding between Julian and the soldiers. It could have been, you know, the soldier who wrote down the name of this wrote it down wrong. And that's how we have this name. But we just don't know entirely where the S comes from, but it is most certainly an American affectation that was added on to the name here. And uh, we even have, uh, and I couldn't find, sorry, I wanted to add a picture of it, but I could not find a digitized version of this. Um, but there from uh, Luis Ortiz's time here, we have stylized, um, like, uh, oh gosh, headers. What are those called? Like a, like a header on, a, on stationery. Um, yeah, of, of it saying Los Lucetos on the stationery that was sent to the, the U.S. government that Luis Ortiz made on agricultural and livestock reports. 
And on top of that, Mary Wheelwright and Marie Chabot, in all of their prolific letter writing, called this place Los Lucelles the entire time they lived here. Um, in addition to that, every person who they knew, who they brought to Los Lucelles, called it Los Lucelles. And so it's known this way in books, it's known this way in maps, and um, I'm okay with the decision to keep it. It makes for a fun story and a little, a little interesting tidbit for people who want to know. Um, but uh, that is the end of my presentation on the Lucero name. Um, I think I'm right about on time. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, our main phone number, the 1165, has been uh, persnickety the last couple days and it's not been going through. So I added a second phone number that we're using right now, the 4379 number. So if you have any really pressing questions that you want to call with, um, I'm typically the one who answers the phone. Uh, but I do also, I did also add my state email here and I help with all research requests. So if you have some questions about Los Lucetos, the history here, you can most certainly email them to me. But I will open it up to questions right now if anyone has one. And, and we can wait if anyone types in a question. Yes? Can you uh, talk about um, who was here before uh, the land grant happened? Oh, yes. Um, and that's not something to overlook. I just definitely took a focus on that. But the question was, just in case we didn't all hear it, was um, who was here before the land grant? Um, and that was, uh, this is Tewa ancestral land. And uh, there is a Pueblo here, it's called Fioge Pueblo. And Fioge means flicker place in Tewa, and which is a very accurate name because we have like eight species of woodpecker here. And they are all over the place. I can hear them all spring pecking on things to attract mates. Um, and uh, we have found artifacts here from 1400s but we know that Fioge was inhabited most likely from the 1100s to pretty much when Onyate got here in uh, 1598. And uh, this was ancestral land, like I said, but then after that, the people of Fioge made a conscious decision to leave Fioge Pueblo. They weren't forced out by Onyate, although he did factor into their decision from what we can tell based on oral histories. Uh, they left and actually established a village in Hopi called Tewa Village. And so if you're ever in Hopi and you want to visit Tewa Village, the people in Tewa Village are descended straight from this land. And yes? Um, do you have descendants uh, of these families you've talked about to visit today? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, so the question was, do we have descendants uh, visit? So I did talk a little bit about the Lucero family members who drop in. But we do, we actually have um, people who visit from Hopi Pueblo, who are descendants of Fioge Pueblo, and we had a big group of elders come out last summer and visit. Uh, we also have, surprisingly, members from the Ortiz family come visit, and I, I had never had someone from the Ortiz family visit until today, and she came in, she was a descendant of Luis Ortiz, a direct descendant, and she was excited to see where her like great 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 grandfather had lived and uh so you know, yeah we get a lot of people we get a lot of community connections happening here uh through the loose settles but also through other people who have lived here we even have a family who comes in kind of regularly who are direct descendants of santiago loose the first loose settle to live here so yeah we, we have some pretty strong Lucero connections. And um, a lot of the children from Abel and Ursula's family still live in and around Alcalde and Española. Um, but yes, any anything else? Are there any books published on these families or where did you get all your information from? Oh yes, good, good point. Oh, I did not put a site. Um, a lot, sorry, my bad. I've not given a presentation in a long time um, like this. I give a lot of tours. Um, I got a lot of this information from the Adobe Kingdom, which is a wonderful book written by a Lucero. I believe it's David Lucero. Um, but the Adobe Kingdom has really intense and very good information on most of the founding families of Santa Fe. There are also a few, um, it was for, what was it, the tricentennial? It was for the tricentennial of Santa Fe's founding. Um, no, it was for the, 
what's the 400 year one? A, a, quar, a quartan sale? Um, it was for like the 400 year uh, founding of Santa Fe. They had a series of um, booklets printed on each family that was found here. And there's one for the Lusado de Godoy family. They're kind of hard to find and it's literally just a pamphlet. Uh, but I, I was able to find a digitized copy of that and read it and it had a lot of really good information. Um, there's also, oh gosh, if anybody wants a site sorted, I will totally, or a, a site, a work cited, uh, I will, I will completely email it to you. I will. Um, I just, uh, I don't know why I didn't add it. I thought about it and totally forgot. <laughs> um, but yes, and then a lot of times, um, like ancestry.com is actually pretty good. Although some of the ancestry websites I have found have conflicting information. Like the death date for Julian Lucero, I have found in three different places, two of them are correct and one of, and having him die at the age of 86. And one of them says that he died when he was 57, which was two years before his last child was born, which that math is not mathing. So <laughs> like he definitely, you know, didn't sire a child from the grave. <laughs> like he was definitely married and still alive when his youngest daughter was born. Um, and so like, just, just be wary of that. I also found, um, for Luis and Eliza, one ancestry website said that they had 10 children together. And I know they only had five. I know they only had five. So it's, you know, just take ancestry websites with a grain of salt. I always try to like double or triple cross check ancestry websites because they can have so much conflicting information. Yes, at the back. Um, we have a question from Jane online that asks, do Lucero descendants ever get together? Do many live locally or elsewhere? I have not heard of a big Lucero family gathering, although I'm sure they do happen. Um, I know that we've had people ask about having family gatherings here in the past. Um, and that was before we had a policy in place to do that. And so you can, it, that is something that we would be very open to if we wanted to do something with a Lucetto family gathering. I know that the Ortiz family actually just had a gathering in Santa Fe recently, um, but uh, they wanted to know about gatherings and what was the rest of the life. Do many live locally or elsewhere? Oh yes, um, yeah, so Lucettos live all throughout the state. So most Lucettos claim their descendants as, uh, or their ancestors as Pedro Lucero de Godoy. And like I said, he had two sons, if not three, and um, there were more than 2,000 families with the last name Lucero in the late 1800s. So there are Lucettos all throughout the American Southwest. A big contingency of the Lucero family from here, I think it was the three oldest brothers from the Abel and Ursula's family moved to California. So we get a lot of Lucettos from California coming out here to visit, sort of like as a pilgrimage. A lot of different branches of their family have come out. They usually call ahead, which is kind of fun. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of Lucettos from California. There are also a lot of Lucettos in Colorado too. Um, and so you'd have to look into your own ancestry to maybe see like how you're connected or if you're connected specifically to Los Lucettos. But yes, they are, all over New Mexico, very prolific family. Like Julian Lucero had 10 children himself, six girls and four boys. Yes. Great, that's all the online questions I have. Oh, okay. Any, anything else? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I hope that was a good presentation. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs>